Welcome. Um, I'm John Rupel. I'm a faculty member here at the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment at uh, the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law. And welcome back to the 25th Annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Michael Roberts, who will talk about food and the law. Michael is the founding and executive director of the Resnick Center for Food, Law, and Policy at UCLA's School of Law. Sorry, we just got cat bombed there. Um, he is particularly interested in the global uh, governance of food and recently led the Resnick Center into a partnership with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization on a series of research and advisory incentives to confront global food security, nutrition, safety, and quality. He authored the first treatise on food law, entitled Food Law in the United States. It was published by Cambridge University Press. He's also a co-editor of a new case book, Food Law and Policy, and he has lectured around the world uh, on food law subjects at law schools and conferences worldwide, including uh, in the US, China, Korea, in the UK, Italy, Canada, Spain, Romania, and, and in Russia. Michael uh, proudly holds a BS and JD degree from our own uh, University of Utah, as well as an LLM in agricultural law from the University of Arkansas. So Michael, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you, I appreciate that uh, very generous introduction, John. And uh, I was hoping to be in person because I still have a child who lives in Salt Lake City and uh, always look forward to the visit. But nevertheless, these are interesting times and it's good to be with you uh, online, if nothing else. Um, I'm particularly pleased to uh, introduce this uh, topic of food law uh, in the context of an environmental uh, law focused conference. Uh, because of the of the convergence that food law uh, brings to the table uh, in many respects. Uh, and uh, it's a good opportunity for us to continue to share information and to explore approaches uh, to solve problems, uh, real problems in the modern world, both uh, for the plant uh, for the planet, actually. Um, Okay, you're gonna to have to edit this. I'm on eight. Oh, yeah, we can edit this out. If you just click on, there you go, now it should work. Okay, got okay. it. So just go mm -hmm. ahead and uh, go back to the first screen, give it to count of three, and then go ahead and start again, and we'll edit that part out. Okay, all right, I think I'm ready now. So what I'd like to accomplish today is to introduce food law, and then to frame food law uh, within the themes of this conference, namely the environment, food security, and equity. And then finally, uh, look at pressing and emerging issues that connect us to what I call this convergence of systems thinking that really connects food law to, again, the themes of this conference. Food law, as I describe in the treatise that I published a few years ago, is both old and new. It really does go back, um, all the way back to the Roman Empire and even uh, prior to the Roman Empire in Western civilization. We've been regulating food for as long as we can remember. Uh, but in modern terms, food law is also new uh, and represents a growing interest in adapting law to a set of problems that's presented by the modern food system. The first food law and policy course uh, that I was fortunate to teach at the University of Arkansas when I was on the faculty there was in 2004. And it was, I, I was I've been completely uh, stunned ever since then as to the growth of this field as now more than 40 law schools are teaching a class uh, related uh, on food law and policy or related to this topic. There's also a number of uh, centers and programs. Uh, Lori, who will be speaking after me, uh, was involved, uh, directed the uh, um, Ag and Food Law Program at Vermont. Uh, there's a number of other programs and centers around the country that are either on point uh, with food law topics or uh, certainly have uh, interests that strongly relate to it. Um, we have a number of student associations uh, around the country. I just returned from a food law academy uh, that was, we've alternated 
uh, locations two years ago. It was held at UCLA uh, last year at Harvard and then this year at the University of Arkansas that uh, had uh, well over um, 60 law schools represented by, by students uh, from around the country. I should note, and, and it's, we just don't have time to get into these distinctions, but there is a distinction between, uh, at least on the, uh, in some ways, from food law policy as it exists today, from the traditional FDA law that has been taught in law school for many years, focusing on the coupling of food and drug law that's really administered out of the FDA, uh, and then agricultural law, which has also been around for a long time and has been taught at land-grant uni land universities. Uh, both of these areas are both actually converging, and you see this convergence of sort of all three disciplines. Uh, it's, it's a bit messy, but at least it provides uh, a platform for a lot of people interested in food from many different angles. The uh, Resnick Center at UCLA for Food Law and Policy, I want to introduce it just a bit in order to give you a flavor as to what's going on in food law and again how it converges uh, in different ways. Uh, we started this center in 2014 at the law school. It really is a think tank, but it's fully enveloped and fully involved in curriculum, curriculum building and in all ways with the law school. Uh, last year, our classes uh, in our independent research and the Student Food Law Association uh, really touched on 74 different students at UCLA. Um, and as I mentioned, it's being taught at various law schools around the country, and I've listed a few here on the screen. Uh, where classes have been recently taught uh, or have been taught for, for quite some time. Um, just to uh, give you a sense, uh, we just, uh, we were, we had an event that was scheduled last week, but for obvious reasons was canceled, uh, looking at meat consumption, which is really an interesting issue at the crossroads of uh, food law and has real uh, implications uh, on the environment as well. In addition to events and classes, uh, and I should mention our classes range from um, a introduction to food law and policy course that we teach at UCLA. We also, I teach a, a history of food law course to first year law students as part of a special set of uh, classes that we offer for first year law students to give a perspective on law. Uh, we also have a clinic uh, at our law school, uh, which represents live clients and involves uh, food law uh, issues. And we have other courses that are offered uh, during the year that range from issues addressing preemption to class action litigation and other issues of interest. Uh, we also have publications, and John mentioned a few of those in his introduction, uh, but here's a, um, an event flyer that, uh, of the conference that we unfortunately canceled, although we did do a roundtable online in place of it uh, that was very, very interesting and productive. Uh, but this is a conference that was uh, featuring the meat consumption at a crossroads, looking at the future of food. And uh, it was to be presented by uh, Dr. Mike Rayner, who's a professor of population health at the University of Oxford, which has a very uh, interesting future of food program uh, that uh, has involved scholars, including myself, uh, around the world. I should mention that I'm gonna go pretty fast in this presentation because the introduction of food law to the topics of today's conference uh, really requires more of a context and a perspective and framing. And for that reason, I'm going to cover quite a bit of territory. But here's another um, an event that we had that again showcases uh, some of the diversity of thought. Uh, we were <clears throat> fortunate to have the now former Director General of the, of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, Jose Graziana da Silva, Come and prevent on food and the global agenda uh, addressing hunger and malnutrition. Uh, but his point was that he, as, as he made in his talk, uh, that there is a connection between these concepts uh, and the environment, especially um, climate change. We also had a very interesting presentation here recently, well, back in October, I should say, time flies, um, from a group of lawyers who won a very large verdict uh, linking the herbicide roundup to cancer. And I'm sure that many of you have heard of this case. Uh, the attorneys, uh, uh, this was our largest attended lunchtime event at the law school, and it attracted a, uh, a really uh, interested group of both students and faculty and others around, uh, both at the law school and the uh, university. 
Uh, we also have held a, a series of annual conferences with, Har with Harvard Law School, uh, which also has a, a, a two different food law programs. One is a what they call a food law lab, which is more of an academic approach to food law, uh, and which is headed up by a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Jake Gerson, and uh, a food law clinic at Harvard. <laughs> but we've combined with the, <coughs> excuse me, with the um, with a lab for a series of conferences. Uh, and this one was looking at the uh, innovation and its connections to food law policy. Uh, we also uh, are, are global, as was mentioned in the introduction. And we've held a series of initiative workshops, for example, in China and other countries around the world. Uh, this was an announcement back in 2016 where we held a five-day leadership workshop in Shanghai on food safety. A uh, couple of our publications already referenced the treatise and then a new case book uh, that, are, that is being used in classes around the country on food law. Uh, again, uh, my co-authors, uh, Jake Gerson from Harvard and Margo Pollins, who was the first uh, fellow at UCLA in our food law policy center and who is now a, an associate professor at uh, Pace uh, focusing on the environment and food law systems. Now, uh, enough for that introduction. Uh, defining food law. Food law really is a little bit of it, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, I came up with that definition after staying up all night worrying about how I would define food law to students uh, when I first taught uh, the class on food law and policy. It really is a multi-doctrinal approach uh, to a an area of uh, a sector. Uh, in the world that is really complicated and full of lots of really interesting issues. In the treatise, at least, uh, that I published, identified various phases of food law in the modern food system, uh, including commerce, which actually can be subdivided into trade uh, and uh, issues related to economic adulteration or food fraud, which is really an economic-oriented uh, regulation of food. But we also have food safety, which is really, uh, in many respects, the foundation of food regulation. Uh, and certainly uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak ha could have, if, if the origins of coronavirus are consistent with what many of us are being told, uh, have some interesting food safety implications. Uh, food marketing, which is certainly uh, includes uh, labeling and advertising of food, an area rich for regulation, it ranges from targeting of advertising to children to common food labels that you find on food product in the grocery store. Nutrition, as we deal with rising obesity rates and diabetes, a very rich area for programs that address these issues, as well as litigation, as well as uh, various legal approaches, uh, ranging from uh, attempts to try to regulate the size of portion controls or menu labeling or special warning labor, labels on sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, and then finally, what I refer to as food system approaches. And this is really the area where we find convergence. Although all of these areas are cumulative and they overlap, uh, certainly food system approaches are what really most of us focus on with, with respect to uh, the convergence and new food law issues. I want to uh, serve as a reminder of the common conversions between environmental law and food law that I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, and these range from tr uh, traditional farming practices and the, the uh, issues of pollution and how ag practices affect uh, human health, especially when we talk about very large farms, especially animal that, that, that contain animals such as consolidated animal feeding operations known as CAFOs and other such practices. But there's a, a, a rich inventory of environmental harms that we focus on in food law and we think about uh, that, in, that range from habitat loss to soil erosion to, uh, and you can read the list yourself. Um, but these are all issues and topics that, that relate to food law and environmental law, of course, uh, in different ways to different degrees. I also want to mention the other interesting aspect of environmental law and food law, which is what we refer to as exceptionalism which is those of you that are familiar with the, uh, the Clean Water Act, uh, certainly this is an issue uh, where there's a tension between trying to, to protect and to preserve and to promote 
uh, farming and farmers and their practices uh, within a strict regulatory environment. And certainly uh, all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, we have this notion that, that farms are exception, that, that, offer, that, that there's a, a degree of exceptionalism involved in farming. There's an ideal, a myth many would regard. Uh, and so these are issues that uh, deal with food policy and ones that we think about in terms of food production as it relates to the environment. There are uh, uh, forms of government, I think, are a, a rich area of, of looking at food law. And I've listed some of these forms, I think, that will be of interest. Certainly, there's regulation, uh, both on a national uh, and a state level. The regulations on a national level were started with the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act uh, that was then amended uh, by the 1938 uh, Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act which then has been amended hundreds of times since then. But this is really the bedrock of national approach or national regulation of food. Uh, and um, at the state level, uh, there are all, it's a rather complicated uh, system, but states regulate, for example, retail uh, markets, uh, whole, uh, supermarkets, restaurants. There is this relationship between natural, national and state regulation that involves delegation. Uh, and then uh, certainly uh, we see um, uh, a number of issues related on preemption uh, that um, govern this federalist, federalism approach to food law. Uh, there's a lot of local communities that have entered into uh, the arena of regulation uh, that has generated a great deal of controversy. For example, in San Francisco, in the Ninth Circuit, there is a pending case looking at warning labels on sugar-sweetened beverages uh, that the city has attempted to um, insert uh, that is being opposed and one of these issues is, is uh, preemption. Uh, states preempting actually uh, municipal action. Uh, I, I, I really, I, I, even though this is a health issue, I think it's important to recognize that these kinds of issues are certainly seeping over into environmental claims on labels as well and I think we'll see a lot more litigation in this area. Speaking of litigation, this is certainly a second form of food law or governance approach. Uh, and I'll talk about litigation in just a minute, on class action litigation especially. <clears throat> a third area uh, of governance is, uh, involves government programs. Lori's going to speak to you about the U.S. Farm Bill, which is uh, a huge uh, and a really impressive form of governance uh, that uh, regulates and, uh, and develops programs to address many of the issues that arise out of the modern food system. Another area that doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think is really, really important, are, is the international governance. There is a Codex Alimentarius Commission, for example, that's the child of the World Trade, World, uh, Trade Organization and the uh, UN FAO uh, that sets standards for food. And there's been a lot of pressure for the, these standards to move into the environmental field as well. Uh, but these standards um, really help govern trade and uh, standards that are used for trade disputes. And again, a lot of movement in this area. Uh, another area is what I call new governance. And these really involve self-regulation, private standards that are developed by supermarkets in the form of contracts that oftentimes regulate environmental issues. Um, so uh, for example, supermarkets which, are, which use uh, private standards will use uh, labels uh, or private standards to uh, that then generate information that they could put on food labels to uh, convey information to consumers about environmental practices that might be followed by supermarkets. These are really interesting contractual ways of governance, if you will. I, 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 even though this is used in a lot of different sectors, I single out food because I think it reflects certainly the complexity of the food supply chain and generates a lot of very interesting issues uh, related to trade and the governance of food. <clears throat> this framework um, is also uh, uh, assessed within the what we call fragmented food regulatory system. There are 15 different agencies at least that govern on a federal level that govern food over 3,000 plus state and local agencies, again, that regulate 
uh, retail, restaurants, and other forms of uh, food enterprises. Uh, an interesting area, for example, of food regulation is online regulation involving third-party platform uh, servers of food. Um, but the primary agencies that, uh, that regulate food are listed on your screen that include the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, the Federal Trade Commission, which regulates a great deal of the advertising of food, and of course, the Environmental Protection Agency. When I talk about food systems approaches, I, I need to make something very clear here. Uh, oftentimes, the word system is used uh, by many to uh, suggest that there is a food system. Um, as, as lawyers, we're very careful and we try to be precise with our use of words. And I want to make it very clear that there really is not a food system out there. Uh, if there's, in fact, there's anything but a system, uh, especially in terms of law. As I just uh, referred to you, there is a, a highly fragmented approach to the regulation of food. We refer to a food system as many different components within a food supply chain, but there is no system. In fact, it's very unsystem-like. If you look at the definition of system, there's no rationality or, or very little rationality or coherence to what we do with food. But there is a form of thinking that we call systems thinking that really is, was developed in high-tech circles. And certainly we uh, accept and we employ and we believe in food systems thinking. But the, the short term of, the shortcut term of food systems in my mind belies the, the complexity about the modern food system, so to speak. Uh, and it's certainly uh, food systems thinking uh, uh, brings us to this uh, thinking about the convergence of all of these issues that I've listed so far, including safety, labeling, nutrition, animal, welfare, environment, and most importantly, climate change. So what I would like to do now is pivot and to look at some of the manifestations of systems thinking, especially as it relates to the themes of this conference. For example, the mission of the Resnick Center, which really is, follows mission statements from a lot of other entities that are involved in food, now bring, couples the quality of the health and quality of life for humans and the planet together. And I think that's really profound, not because it's our mission statement, but because it reflects the thinking out there that there is this connection between health and diet and uh, the planet with respect to food. For example, uh, pesticides. We all, and this is just a, a real simple primer slide on the regulation of pesticide regulation as it relates to food safety with respect to the three agents, three of the agencies that I've listed earlier on my screen, the EPA, the FDA, and the Department of Agriculture, all regulating pesticides <clears throat> in different ways with different missions uh, and with the bedrock, of course, of the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996 that provided for a single standard for pesticide residue in food. There was a recent article um, in the Environmental Health in 2020 that was critical of the EPA for failing to follow the FQPA and to protect children from pesticides in food. This is both an environmental issue as well as a food safety issue. I'm not going to read this, but if you can read, I'll pause for just a minute so you can absorb the slide, but this is from the background, uh, from the abstract of the paper. That lists the requirement of the EPA to set allowable le levels for pesticides to ensure no harm to children. With a standard of safety, The discussion uh, in the abstract, the paper, um, lists various pesticides um, that were analyzed and lays out the approach uh, for the paper. Most importantly, the conclusion, as I've listed here, and I will read this, for the majority of pesticides reviewed in this study, the EPA did not apply an additional FQPA safety factor, missing an opportunity to fully use the Acts Authority for Protecting Children's Health. And so this is an, an example, again, of this convergence between food safety law and environmental protection, or the failure thereof. Another interesting example 
uh, of this connection involves honey. If you remember earlier to, uh, in my presentation, I referenced food fraud or what we call economic adulteration. Honey uh, is one of the most adulterated products that you can find in the marketplace. If you go to your regular supermarket and buy honey off the shelf, you're probably getting something that has been adulterated, meaning it has been, there's been added to, uh, honey has been subtracted therefrom, uh, a lot of different additives and sweeteners especially have been added to the honey uh, to, to make it something that's different than the kind of honey that we would refer to as real honey. Now, without going into the science of the honey, the point I wanna make is that there was a white paper that we recently uh, published at the Resnick Center that showed that this problem of food or fraud in honey is really an ecosystems problem. Now, what do I mean by that? We all know the importance of pollination. Well, honeybees just don't go out and pollinate agriculture uh, on their own. There has to be a manager of the pollination herd, if you will. And these managers are the same farmers that produce honey. The problem with food fraud or honey fraud is, is the result is a depressed price. So we get a lot of fraudulent honey coming in from Asia, for example, that depresses the price in the United States. So in the United States, you have this strange phenomena where you have smaller amounts of honey being produced by US producers, but an incredible demand for honey in the marketplace. Honey is very popular. You would think that you would have an increase in price, but that's just the opposite of what we have. We have continued almost a collapse in price due to the flooding in the US market of adulterated imported honey. It's driving the honey producers out of business. Without honey producers, we don't have managers or pollinators. Without pollination, we have a real eco food system issue. This has caught the attention of supermarkets. So for example, Whole Foods has run demonstrations in their food stores showing what happens when we don't have pollination. Half the food disappears in a, in a grocery store. Walmart has actually patented a couple years ago a honeybee robot or drone, if you will, that would actually pollinate in place of the honey bee. Whether it works or not is certainly uh, open to question. But the point is, is that this is a really interesting way of connecting food law, looking at the fraud, fraud of, of a product and its implications on the environment. Now, there has been an explosion of food labeling class action litigation in the US, so, and I mean an explosion. Uh, mostly focused on claims make, made on honey label, or excuse me, on food labels uh, involving health. But I think we may be turning to environmental and animal claims as well, or sometimes known as greenwashing. This is a chart that I, uh, Perkins Cooey was, uh, the law firm was generous to share with me in a recent publication that shows this explosion of class action litigation. You can see from the chart, uh, it's an amazing amount of class action litigation. These are large cases, many of which are filed in California. Northern California is affectionately known as the food court uh, as a result, but also New York and other states that are now starting to see a spike in food litigation as well. In the Perkins Cooey report, there were seven animal welfare cases that were uh, noted in 2019. This is a quote directly from the report uh, that refers to, uh, for example, dolphin safe labels <clears throat> and um, and then the remaining cases, as you look at that last sentence in the report on your screen, generalized advertising by meat, egg, and dairy products, um, implying messages about the company's treatment of animals or related environmental practices. I think we're going to see more and more litigation connected to environmental practices that are conveyed on a food label uh, for consumers because of the popularity of, of uh, for consumers, the popularity of the conveyance of information about whether food is uh, environmentally friendly or not, especially with uh, the connection with climate change and food. Now, so this trajectory of litigation, greenwashing, again, um, plant-based meat substitutes. There's a ton of litigation going on right now. Many see plant-based meats as, a, as favorable towards the environment. Uh, there are a number of state laws that restrict the ability of plant-based meats from using the word meat on labels. Um, the FDA is under considerable pressure 
uh, to resolve this issue. Certainly cellular meat, which is an interesting uh, product that I think is probably a lot further out in the future than, than many uh, suppose, uh, will also raise a lot of really interesting questions about labeling, identification. Uh, and all of, these, all of these products have environmental consequences. Again, this connection between food and the environment. I also should mention that the FDCA, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, ha does not allow for a private cause of action, which is why we see these state uh, class action litigation claims where labeling, which is really kind of the, the way that we communicate information about food to the public, uh, is these claims are brought under state law, uh, and that's the way of litigation in food cases, namely because there is no private cause of action, which is very different than a lot of the environmental acts, as you all well know. Now, I, I don't want to say much about this just because this is Lori's presentation, but uh, another emerging area of food regulation, again, is through programs, which uh, are mostly housed in what we call the USDA Farm Bill. It's an amazing piece of legislation. It's the only bill that brings Republicans and Democrats uh, to the same table, even in recent Farm Bills, there have been strains at that uh, alliance. But it's the closest thing we have to a national food policy, for better or for worse, I would probably say for worse, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is what we it is what it is. But it, food farm bill is an omnibus, multi piece of authoriz authorizing legislation that covers an array of agriculture and food programs. It brings together progressives in the uh, uh, who are interested in nutrition programs, and it also brings together uh, conservatives or at least those who uh, promote agricultural program agricultural subsidies uh, together in the same bill. I'm going to leave the farm bill now to Lori. I also want to address this really interesting concept of, of frameworks uh, for what I call food system norms. And these are norms that we just don't have time enough in this presentation to really dive into, but just know that they're there, they're interesting, a lot of people are talking about them, it's attracting a great deal of interest from scholars. These relate to food security, the right to food, to equity, I have on the, on the picture here um, on my slide, uh, uh, Dr. Halal Elver, who was, the, uh, most, who was the special rapporteur to the United Nations for Right to Food. The United Nations has several different special rapporteurs. She is for Right to Food. She's also a senior fellow uh, at our center at UCLA. And she works very much in these areas of right to food and food security and equity, spending a great deal of her focus, for example, on climate change and its impact in these areas. But we, I ask my students all the time as we deal with, when we look at these norms, are these operational constructs? Are they social and cultural norms? Or are they legal theories? Do they have a constitutional basis? In the US, we may say no, because we're, we, our constitution is a con constitution of negative rights. But in places like India, the answer may be yes. And there's a lot of litigation in countries around the world that relate to right to food. Are they simply political theories? These are all interesting questions, but these are norms that really link in many, many ways food to the environment. And I, I also have on the slide uh, a, a publication on food equity uh, that our center published a few years ago uh, that again, flesh out these ideas of justice, equity, right to food, food security, all that bring to the table uh, a way of thinking about food and the way we produce food, the way we uh, manufacture food, the way we distribute food, and the, the, even the ways we buy, buy food and consume food that all relate to environmental considerations. So I think I've taken up my a lot of time and it's a little odd to stop without hearing questions from all of you, but I do think that hopefully what this presentation has done is to convey to you this, this new world of food regulation and how it relates to all of us and how it especially relates to the environment and to environmental considerations. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Michael. That was really helpful, really informative and a, a very useful overview of, of food law and policy. I have a, a couple of questions. I guess I'd start by asking, what are the issues on the horizon? What is it that's coming that we may not be thinking about in terms of food law and, and food security and, and food policy? Well, I, 
I hesitate to answer that question because I don't want to overlook climate change, and that is on all of our minds. And, and I really think that's the big issue. Um, and certainly the contribution of cows to climate change is something that uh, it, I, I think a few years ago a lot of folks thought was rather silly. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fact that cows and animal agriculture contribute to environmental degradation and contribute to climate change in a way that's very unique. I was at a conference recently in Washington, D.C., where I heard a, a, a representative of a large meat exporter say that in order to meet the demand for, for meat in the future with China and India's growth, that we're going to have to double the, uh, our animal supply for food animals. We, we, there's no way we can do it. And what's interesting is, is that, um, is that uh, you know, a lot of countries recognize this, especially China. So maybe in answer to your question, I, I would probably say that my, what many of us may not be thinking about is the relationship between diet and climate change. So this, in, in many uh, of, and I didn't include it in my presentation, uh, but, but most countries, including the United States, have dietary guidelines that are issued every once in a while, every four to six years. The dietary guidelines that the U.S. put out, which is a combination effort between the USDA and the FDA, there was a link made between diets and sustainability or the environment. That caught the wrath of the meat, meat industry, the, especially the uh, producers of meat. And, and that was taken out of the dietary guidelines uh, by Secretary Vilsack in the Obama administration. That shows you the political pressure at play here, that this link is really, really important if we're going to address this important issue of climate change and environmental degre degradation as it relates to diets. And so what people eat really does affect the environment. And I think that that's a platform where you'll see a lot, a lot more discussion that may not be on everyone's radar. Most environmentalists are probably not thinking about the dietary guidelines but it's there and it directly relates to these issues. Okay, I wanna follow up a little bit. Uh, you, you made some comments about the, the roles of law and policy and science and how they interact. And I wonder if you can talk a little more about that intersection, about um, how policy choices drive, drive the law and drive um, Drive, drive legal development and how science fits in uh, to development of, of food law. I'm thinking about uh, some proposed EPA policies on uh, science transparency, and I wonder what their relevancy is to food law. Yeah, it's a, it, there's a huge area of relevancy here. This is a really good question. Uh, the impact of science on policy and law, I think, is fascinating. Um, one of the struggles, for example, we have in food right now say nutrition, for example, is, and I think this relates to environmental questions as well, especially when we talk about the use of um, or, or, uh, um, pesticides or, for example, antibiotic resistance that we now see developing because of what we feed animals. But the question is, you know, what, what is the level of science that we need in order to make policy change? Uh, one of the great debates in nutrition is over observational studies and the lack of controlled studies, for example. There was a recent report in the New York Times where there was a study that criticized observational studies and basically said that eating red meat is, is, is okay for, for people health-wise. It was a fairly misleading article and has under, undergone a lot of criticism. It's, it's, there's a lot of questions of ethics that are involved in, that explain why we rely on observational studies. You can't give young people, nothing but soda to consume for five years to determine the effects. It's the same reason why tobacco is based on observational studies early on. And there really are very few controlled studies that show the linkage between tobacco and cancer, for example. We know what we have, but we see the same debate occurring in, in, in the world of food. And so it's really difficult sometimes to argue for policy change uh, when we don't necessarily have the science, according to many critics. But, but the same applies to climate change. The same applies, again, to tobacco. And so this, this intersection of science and policy and law is really, really interesting, and the debate goes on. I, for one, believe that we need to have good science. I'm not suggesting that we don't. We have to have 
And we've got, we need to have more science. We need to have science that's focused on what, on these issues. But this relationship, I think, is really, really important. How much do we need to know before we act? How much do we have to be certain about climate change before we do something? How much do we need to know about antibiotics being fed to animals before we, we make decisions uh, that would affect antibiotic resistance in humans, especially children? Uh, how much do we need to know about pesticide residue before we make decisions about regulating pesticides perhaps more strictly than we do, following the example of Europe, uh, before we make these changes? So these are really interesting questions. And, 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 and I think what we need to do is build bridges between science and policymakers and law and have conversations. Uh, and the other thing I will mention is that the, the conflicts of interest in science, I think, are, are really important to address. You've got to find out who's funding science. Uh, and it, has, it needs to be transparent. It needs to be clear. And that's a really important uh, piece to this in order to, to, to determine what's credible, or at least to understand uh, what may be the interest behind the science. Thanks, that's, that's really insightful. Final question. Um, if you had a magic wand, what changes would you make to food law and why? And does the current coronavirus uh, crisis create a policy opening for major policy changes? Yeah, if I had a magic wand, I think I would, I would bring, uh, I would consolidate agents, the regulation of, by agencies. Uh, but I don't think it can be done. Uh, I was in South Korea recently and gave a talk, and the question was, should we have one major food agency that regulates food, or should we follow the U.S. approach where we have lots of different agencies? I think we're far better off having a single agency, especially with food safety, but I don't think politically it's, it's reasonable. I don't think it's possible. Um, but I do think that, 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 there, that what we need in place is a lot of communication between agencies. A heightened degree of food systems thinking amongst regulators is really, really important. Otherwise, we're siloed. And the EPA, it, it, it's frustrating on, very, on a lot of different levels that, to have EPA regulating pesticides when the residues present a food safety question. That's the province of the, F, of the FDA. Honey example is just a small example of how this also works. It's interesting because Euro the European Parliament, as we point out in our Honey White Paper, actually recognized this and called for a reduction of fraud in honey in order to preserve pollination. And that's the sort of thinking we need, is we need food systems thinking, and I guess that's my magic one wish, is that we would really have more food systems thinking in terms of regulation of food of, of the modern food system so we can better preserve the environment and the planet and as well as achieve our dietary goals. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's a great answer and a, a, uh, I think a great transition into our next speaker. Thank you.